Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. Ah, the Occidental Trap, the Neurosis, the Spiral of Death, Dante's Hell, an eternal maze of nonsensical self-preoccupation. What is my value? Which boils down to, well, nothing. Then you build a philosophy department and create an entire field of study to examine, well, nothing. You even give it a fancy Latin name so that none of you look useless when interacting with engineers and medical doctors. You know, people who actually do something. You call it nihilism. Wow, cool, deep. That's my value, you exclaim. I can label stuff that no one cares about and sound smart at parties. I can pout, become indignant, and smirk at working class people who tell me that I do not make sense. I can pressure corporate boards to fire people who do not use my fake terminology because I have value. Well, Unlike you, I do not have value. I am nothing. I have nothing. I bring nothing. And nothing you have to offer is of value to me. I bore you. Yawn. But like Paul, I do not trust you. And more importantly, I do not trust myself. I'm just a bumpkin from the west side a punk who did not attend a fancy school. One thing I do know is that if an idiot jumps in front of a moving bus, he will get smashed. Sadly, I'm absolutely certain that in your dream world, this fact is up for debate. Good luck, because once again, I do not trust you. You hear scripture dismantle me, and you cheer. You hear scripture dismantle your imaginary value, and you mourn. Why? Because you not only assume that your supposed value is valuable, you believe that your value is you. The gospel of Jesus Christ, O American, is your permanent teenage identity crisis. Like a teenager trapped in endless rebellion, you defend your identity by reducing scripture to just another book, like one of your Occidental toys, a great work of your boring literature, as if you, O man, have a right to assess it. You deal with it like a trinket on the shelf of your civilization, one that attacks a starving people for being willing to stand up against a genocide you alone have the power to stop. Well, maybe not you. You say you are free, but even as your rulers commit genocide, your votes mean nothing. You are not free. You are just the slave of the wrong master. Only your owner happens to be wealthy. Shame on you. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Picture this. I know you can picture it because you are an idolater. You are your own reference. You stand for yourself and your own prosperity. You refer not to scripture, but to yourself as your reference. You assess your pantheon of ideas, your gods, 
which for you include scripture. How noble of you. And then you refer back to yourself for your decision. Everything on the menu in your dream world is equal except you. You are above everything and everyone, including me. You sound like Jordan Peterson, who builds his edifice on Scripture, building up what Scripture destroys because he seeks to build himself up. Scripture does not hold a special place in your Occidental library. It is not a great work of Western civilization. It is not your foundation. You are not Bible-based. It burns your libraries down, and it burns you. Are you an anti-intellectual, Father Mark? No. Scripture is anti-intellectual because the intellect it assesses is human. Scripture is anti-human and thus anti-humanities. Or do you really believe that Mustafa Barghouti is a sexist? Of course you do. He is a Palestinian medical doctor, and you are a student of the liberal arts, a faithful postmodernist. You have the power to jump in front of moving buses and live. Who needs medical doctors, let alone Palestinians? You really are, Homelander. Scripture is your permanent identity crisis, and it will remain so until you accept that no human being has any value before God. Only then will you finally grow up and maybe become of some actual value to your Father who is in the heavens. Or you can stay in Egypt. Up to you, Habibi. Allahu Akbar. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 515 of the Bible as Literature podcast. In his famous book, Orientalism, Edward Said talks about the way in which Western scholarship imposes its presuppositions, its imagination, its idea about the Middle East upon the Middle East. And Father Paul deals with this, of course, in his own scholarship with respect to the text, what people bring to the text and impose on it. Now, Saeed talks about how Western scholarship imposes its own platonic dream, if you will, to borrow that expression from Lawrence of Arabia, the dreamers of the day. You impose your imagination, the dream of the philosopher tyrant on a people. But in scholarship, you have your own languages, you have your own culture, and you approach a text that is completely alien to your language and your culture, and you impose your premise on that text. Here I'm speaking specifically about Western Hebrew dictionaries. It has been eye-opening and at the same time disappointing to come to terms with the way in which English-speaking students of the Hebrew text are immediately severed, disconnected, cut off from the functionality of the text because the dictionaries themselves sever the terminology of the text. They take a Hebrew function and turn it into a linguistic ontology by taking a function and making it into a philosophical meaning, as though there's an abstract word that means Hebrew, as opposed to a triliteral function that could mean 
based on its functional usage, Hebrew or pass through. And that is deadly. And the examples are endless. The scribes and the Pharisees provide an excellent example of this because they can read out the Bible from memory in the original language, literally backwards and forwards. That's actually one of the exercises they used to do in the ancient world to see if you really memorize something is to recite it backwards. Just try to do the alphabet backwards and you'll see how hard this is. This is what it meant to know the Bible back then. Literally nobody knows the Bible that well anymore. So imagine the person you know who knows the Bible better than anyone you've ever heard and triple that. And that's what we're talking about with the Pharisees and the scribes. They're not dummies. The problem they ran into was not that they were dummies. They were institutionalists. Once scholars approach the text and just assume that the scribes and Pharisees are dummies, they're off and running with their crazy theories based on this poor premise. I've seen it in my own research. I'm reading about Joel and about Hosea. There's all these scholars in the 19th and 20th centuries that are talking about this fertility cult of Israel. And another person I was reading is like, what fertility cult? What does that even mean? Did they have non-fertility cults? What is a fertility cult? It's something that some German dreamed up in their office about life in the Orient. That sounds exactly like what Edward Said describes in Orientalism. Somebody sitting in Europe dreaming about the Middle East. Yeah, and the thing is, Scripture is trying to remind you that the Lord brings all fertility. The Lord is the Lord of the seed, the zera, as Father Paul always talks. Whatever this fertility cult there's fertility cults in Europe, too. I mean, who doesn't want fertility? You go into any church and they'll ask the Lord for rain when it gets too dry. That's how human beings think. We pray to the heavens because that's where life comes from. That's where the sun is and that's where the rain is. But dreaming that the scribes and the Pharisees are just a bunch of dummies, that Oriental people are just a bunch of dummies, that people are other in these other places— and because we don't understand them, this is a problem. I mean, I said in a paper one time that the reason why we've misunderstood these verb forms in Hebrew is because we're just assuming they're going to work like Greek and Latin, which are completely unrelated languages, and they function more like Tagalog in the Philippines or Russian than like Greek. So now what do you do? You have to decolonize Hebrew to understand where it's come from. There are idioms in modern Hebrew that you can translate directly into Russian and they make sense. Why? Because those Russians who came and started up modern Hebrew. But there are verb forms in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, that don't exist in biblical Hebrew. Because there's more of a European sensibility in the language. And it's so easy to impose that. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying... Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, I want to say out of the gate, Richard, that your statement is correct, that the scribes and the Pharisees are intelligent, capable men. And the sin of modern preachers is they fall in the trap of the Nahashic biblical text, and when I say Nahashik, I mean that the text itself is as clever as the Nahash of Genesis. It entraps you. It plays a trick on you. You want to slam the scribes and the Pharisees because you yourself behave like the scribes and the Pharisees, though you're not as intelligent as they are. Which is why it's irritating when you walk into an American church and they say, oh, we're not like the scribes and the Pharisees. All are welcome here. Well, when you have a sign on your church saying all are welcome, guess what? You're being Pharisaic. All of you welcoming North Americans who think you are better than everyone else. As my beloved father would say, you can stick it in your eye because the scribes and the Pharisees are engaged in what Father Paul affectionately, and I'm being sarcastic, Richard, what he affectionately refers to as theologismi, human reasoning. Remember, they are learned men who are seated in order to 
receive instruction and to share instruction by the power of the Lord. Learn it in exactly the way you describe, but instead they are engaged in human reasoning and playing around with human words. And that's a disaster, especially when you consider that they are capable. They have been enabled. This word that is translated in English as can, who can forgive sins but God alone? They're asking this question because they're inclined as those who give instruction to say what everybody says when they're challenged by prophetic instruction. Who are you to tell me? Only God can say that. Well, yes, but it's the power of God that we already heard about earlier in this mashal. It's not Jesus and it's not you. It's the power that is entrusted. And this word can, which is in Greek, dinate, which is dinami, it's power, which everybody in the Occident has a crisis over. It is the crisis of Western culture. Whoa, how can the prophet wield power from the Amvon? Well, that's the whole point, friends, because it corresponds to this Hebrew term, which is rendered as dinami throughout the Septuagint, yakol, which means capable, in Arabic, wakala, agency, which means to be entrusted. You have power. It is delegated to you. It's not yours. It is entrusted to you. It's the power of the Lord in Luke. It's not Jesus's power. It's the power of his father, which means Jesus is able to forgive and to heal by this power. And so, too, should the scribes and the Pharisees, especially because they are learned men. But as you said, Richard, there's something wrong. They're not quite hearing the text correctly. There's something wrong. There's something poisonous mixed in with the milk. They're not getting it right. It's because of the ego. When you hear the prophetic condemnation and your reaction is to critique the prophet or to try to point out the sins of the prophet, it's because despite your knowledge, you want to defend and so you attack. You don't submit. So it's not enough to be learned. Being anti-intellectual is a huge problem in our current cultural climate, as you often point out. But this business of submission and simply accepting the judgment, which is what makes Jesus a central figure in the New Testament, because he submits. What undermines the scribes and the Pharisees is that despite their knowledge, they can't submit so ultimately it breaks down for them and they sound stupid and they behave stupidly because it breaks down. It doesn't work if you can't bow down. That's why I love this expression in Arabic, peace, salam, aslama, I submit. It's connected functionally. And of course, in Genesis, the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able, yakelu, to remain together. So it has to do with ability, capability. And this capability in the Lucan context is entrusted to you. It's the power of the Lord in verse 17. They've been coming from all around because they wanted to see the healing. And a guy was brought in, and he says, your sins are forgiven thee. So Jesus is 
not doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's not performing according to the program. And then they dialogue within themselves. I mean, that's directly from the Greek, dialogista, who can forgive sins but God alone. The scribes and the Pharisees are not being consistent with their own thoughts. On the one hand, they're worried that he might be doing something blasphemous by saying your sins are forgiven, but he's not being blasphemous and healing people. So the scribes and the Pharisees can't figure this out. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? I love this verse because it hits once again on that term in the previous verse. So now we heard it three times, which is, in scriptural terms, Richard, condemnatory. It's a judgment. Jesus is condemning the scribes and the Pharisees for being theological when they should be Torahic. He is saying to the educated, to the learned men of the house of Israel, you are the ones who, in fact, have memorized Torah, but you're not speaking Torah. You are speaking your reasonings, hasab, to think, to account. That is not to meditate on the precepts of the Lord. That is to give your own words. It is, once again, the me, your reasonings. They are not giving an account of the text, they are giving an account of the thoughts of their own heart. In Arabic, hasaba, to calculate, to estimate. In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. Hasabu, Psalm 10, verse 2. This is not by any means a coincidence that we have now three times in the span of two verses, Richard, the alogismos. We are dealing with their reasoning in their hearts. And the word heart, as you well know, is a technical term. I didn't even have to make the case that kardia corresponds to leb in Hebrew. Now, what's Interesting to me in terms of semitology is that lub in Arabic means intellect or discernment, but it also means kernel. So you can argue from the usage of the Hebrew root in the Old Testament that in its own right, it means the seat of intellect. But you have a correspondence in Arabic and also Aramaic and Syriac. I mean, there are other examples in Semitic languages that underscore this point, that in Scripture, heart has nothing to do with feelings. It's about reason. We are talking about the reasonings of the human heart, which Jesus points out in Matthew is where sin comes from, the human heart. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, Leb, was only evil continually. This is Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and I believe that it's the first usage, Richard, of this term, which is the definition of a term in Scripture. It's the lexicon. So here we have the would-be teachers of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, behaving like theologians, intent on speaking their own theologismi, the reasonings and thoughts of their own hearts, which, according to Genesis, are continuously evil. It's a sledgehammer in the Gospel of Luke when you do the archaeology of terms, the archaeology of the text. In our own lexicon in English, heart is the center of emotion. When Jesus is condemning them of reasoning in their hearts, the English speaker is going to think they've got bad feelings about Jesus. But that's not what is in the text. In the text, they are in an impasse. Here's a guy who is able to heal people, maybe in the name of God, but he's also forgiving sins which seems like he's overstepping here. Scribes and the Pharisees know Scripture, and they're trying to sort this. And how are they sorting it? By conversing with themselves. 
Now, the trap is they're not reading scripture. They're conversing with themselves. That's the dialogue, dialogismos. The dialogismos gets them stuck. Maybe a human being can heal people, but forgive sins. It seems like he's taking someone else's job. Is Jesus overstepping? Is Jesus pushing things? That's the conversation they're having. But they need to stop talking and listen. Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. This word, egire, in Greek, egiro, is translated here, get up. I don't know how it's rendered in your English text. This word, of course, elsewhere translated as arise, is a really important term in the New Testament. There are many different words for rise or arise. The most logical correspondence is to the term kum. This word in Hebrew, which aligns to other Greek terms in the New Testament, means stand, stand out, or rise. Famously in Arabic, kama, to stand up. Al-Masih qam. The anointed stood up or stood out. It's an expression that we use in church. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? Yaqimenu, which is Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. Now, there are examples in Judges that shed some light on our hearing of Luke. Then the Lord raised up Yaqem, judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. There are similar examples of this usage in Judges, chapter 2, verse 18, and then again 3, verse 9, and chapter 3, verse 15, in which the Lord raises someone up to take action on behalf of the Lord's people to deliver them or to act on the Lord's behalf to safeguard others. He raises Mikimi, the poor from the dust, and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. This is Psalm 113, verses 7 to 8. So what I'm hearing, Richard, is that Jesus here is raising the paralyzed man to rescue his people from the reasonings, the theologismi of the scribes and the Pharisees. Because the judges are the ones who take care of the people, not as rulers, but as people who judge and mitigate according to the Torah, not according to their own reasonings, as would any tyrant. They are not self-referential. When the scribes and the Pharisees hear the Lord's prophet, Jesus Christ, proclaim the judgment and out of ego react defensively and try to wield the judgment against Jesus, it ceases to be Torah. It becomes some weird reasoning of the human heart. It becomes twisted. It becomes human theology. So the Lord now is raising the paralyzed effectively as a judge to walk according to his precepts. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He delivers from the hands of those who plundered. That's, in effect, the functionality of the term here. He doesn't, as people talk about it in sentimental Western liturgies where people weep and cry and hug each other at church. He doesn't heal the paralyzed man so he can feel better and go home and watch Netflix and say he loves Jesus. Just like he doesn't rescue the sons of Israel from bondage in Egypt so they can be free according to Cecil B. DeMille. It is free of charge with a charge. You raise up a judge in order to judge. That's the key point. You're making an assumption, scribes and Pharisees, that healing is fine, but saying your sins are forgiven, that's stepping over a line. 
Healing, you were at the line saying your sins are forgiven. You overstepped. Let me ask, like, where did this line come from? Because don't forget, this is the same Jesus who in chapter 4 read from the book of Isaiah about how the anointed one comes to heal the poor and to bring good news. When I read Isaiah, it sounds like it's the same person. Just saying. I'm reading scripture, you're reading scripture, and it sounds like it's the same guy. Were you listening when Isaiah was read? The good news is not to the powerful institutionalists, actually. It's to the people who are poor and in need. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what I was called to do, and that's what I'm carrying out. So when I say that sins are forgiven, what does it sound like if you're reading Isaiah? Are you listening to Isaiah? Jesus is undermining their argument. They want to say one is God's job, one is human's job. But when you listen to Isaiah, it's not so clearly separate. And maybe it's actually the job of the person who knows Scripture to recite Scripture so that people know that the good news is coming to them and not to the institution. And this is the insidious part, is that the people who are in the institution are about protecting the institution. I was reading an article about a parish trying to describe the origins of Christianity and how we are the true original church. And it said, well, from the very beginning, Christianity was exclusive. Disgusting. And there were certain things that were considered Christian and certain things that were not considered Christian from the beginning. But what was the first piece of evidence they offered? The Nicene Creed. But Jesus is not bound by the Nicene Creed. There was no Nicene Creed written when Luke was writing. The Nicene Creed came afterwards. Which judges which? Does Isaiah judge the Nicene Creed, or does the Nicene Creed judge Isaiah? Just asking the question here. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home with the authority that is delegated to him. He commands him to get up, and we've talked about these terms. One interesting term stood out that brings full circle the condemnation, once again, of this word that Orthodox in this country love to use, theologismi. It is summarily condemned in Luke. So much so that it chills me to the bone, Richard. Once again, when you pay close attention to terminology, you are emasculated. As the author of the podcast, Mary Reads Scripture, says in her preface, you are invalidated by the text. You are invalidated. So the next time someone gets up and waxes philosophical about the me. Just roll your eyes, close your ears, say the Lord's Prayer, and wait for someone to get up and exegete Scripture. This term, no, K-N-O-W, so that you may know, "etho" in Greek, is the same root as the word "evolon," <laughs> which is... A great word, because it corresponds to, for example, in the book of Daniel, bait, which is bait in Arabic. It's the same word. It means house, which in Daniel is the house of idolatry, the house of the God that you happen to worship. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the bait of God. It could mean the house of any god. And he brought them into the land of Shinar to the house of his god. That's the same thing. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his god. So the word not to know, either, this root throughout the Old Testament is linked to 
idolatry, idolon, which also corresponds in Hebrew to the word gilulim, which means idols in Arabic. <laughs> it's so beautiful. In Arabic, jalil, which means exalted and venerable. So this word, dialogizmi, is the gift that just keeps on giving in the Gospel of Luke. Because you know and you reason and you manufacture idols. If you want to know something, I'm going to show you something. Because what you know is a statue in your head. So I'm going to smash the statue with instruction. You evo, spelled with an omega, see or perceive, know, K-N-O-W, and then you have the term Idos, spelled with an omicron, but it's taken from Ido, and it refers to a platonic form, a shape. That's the word in Greek philosophy that pertains to Plato's form. That's where we get the word Idolion from, the idol's temple. It's the place of the form. It's the building where you manifest your platonic projections. Why do you think I preach against the temple and my priesthood? Come on, people. You must hear the connection. Even here in Greek, you cannot fall in the trap of saying, oh, this is a different word, Father Mark, Edo. No, it's not a different word. This word, no, is the same word for idol. Period. If you're not seeing the connection, you're not hearing the New Testament. Perception, sight, knowledge pertain to idolatry, which is... Again, when you consider the Arabic, that is what is venerable or exalted in human eyes. That's why you are impressed when people wax philosophical, when the Pharisees and the scribes impress you with their knowledge. Now, I'm not elevating anti-intellectualism because it takes work to examine the question of a Hebrew or a Greek root. So we're not saying, let's be lazy and not use our brain. Let's be lazy and complain if the sermon is long. That's not the point. The point is, let's not be lazy and blab about human ideas. Let's work very hard and push ourselves and work on terminology, which is a mental effort that takes a lot of work, but it's not coming from our own reasoning. This is very tough for a society that likes to hear the sound of its own voice. The other fascinating point about this verse, Jesus talks about authority. Exousia is different than Dynamis, but again, it pertains to power, delegated power. Whether we're talking about dynamis or exousia, we're talking about power that is delegated to a locum tenens, a representative, which could just as easily have been the scribes and the Pharisees if they did their job, which is to relate Torah. Jesus talks about the authority so that you will know that the Son of Man, a Ben Adam, any Ben Adam, has the authority to forgive sins. This word corresponds to the Hebrew in the Septuagint, memshalah. Now, all I want to say about this word, memshalah, is that it has the same root, mim, sheen, lamed, as mashal. So it can mean to exercise authority or to have, you know, hegemony or governance over something, but it also means parable. No way in a thousand years are you going to get that from an Occidental dictionary where they list it as a separate word. No way. 
But once you realize and understand functionally, and I won't even use the word connection, Rich, because it betrays the Hebrew. It's not a connection. It's a function. You understand that by reciting the mashal, which is what Jesus is doing, he is exercising the memshalah. And that, my friend, is pure gold. This power, like you said, Father, the exousia, is the authority on which he stands, the same authority on which the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the nomos, the teachers of Torah, stand as well. The Son of Man, you know, the King James loves to capitalize the Son of Man, but it's a Ben Adam, it's a human being. When the men brought in their friend on the pallet, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, based on their faith, on their trust. Here, Luke underscores the point, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power, it's in the plural in Greek. You know, plural. So that you all know that the Son of Man has this authority, this exousia, I say to you, singular, arise, take up your pallet and walk. Now, in the previous verse in 23, I like that the verse is walk because it's peripateo, which Father Paul connects with hitalech, which is the word which means to wander, but it means specifically in Scripture to walk in the ways of Torah. So get up and walk, peripateo, walk correctly. And here he says, I am telling you on this stretcher, pick up your stretcher and go to your house, go walk to your house. But he only speaks to that one person. Well, why would he do that? In Isaiah, the good news was for the poor. It was not for the institutionalists. It wasn't even for the guys who were carrying the stretcher. He didn't say to the guys with a stretcher, your sins are forgiven. He didn't say, go have a good day. (laughs) He didn't even say, have a nice day to them. His only audience was the poor and the infirm, the one who was disabled, the one who was not able to walk under his own strength. Because he didn't have the ability to walk, it was given to him by the one who says, I'm going to send this person to bring good news to the poor, this Torah. And we have teachers of Torah and Pharisees here. They could have been bringing this news. When Jesus stood up in the synagogue, He brought the news just by reading what was in the scroll. The scribes and Pharisees were incorrect because they talked among themselves. Jesus had to teach them what was already written, what they should already know. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.